Hey everyone, welcome back to another Hardware News Recap for the week. For this one, we have a GN-specific week where we have an AMD internal roadmap showing DDR5 on target for some time in the future that we'll talk about. Ryzen 3 1200 and 1300 AF CPUs servicing following the popular Ryzen 5 1600 AF, which was not a Zen 1 part, if you don't remember that. Unigen Community 2 SDK information, TSMC's earnings and node updates, uh, information on Ryzen 3 3100, 3100X, and B550, finally in an official capacity, and Seagate and Western Digital victim blaming for the SMR concerns. Before that, this video is brought to you by the new Be Quiet Straight Power 11 Platinum Power Supply Series, available from 550 watts to 1200 watts. The new Straight Power 11 is platinum certified, operating more efficiently than before, reducing heat and lowering noise levels as a result. The Be Quiet Straight Power 11 Platinum is up to 94.1% efficient and meets the new low power standards of just 0.16 watts when in standby. Learn more about this high-end, noise-focused power supply at the link in the description below. A quick note too, as we start this, uh, we have a test for. So the Zalman CNPS 20X, a lot of you have requested from us. We bought it and we have a review up or coming up soon, so check back for that or check the channel. Uh, AMD has DDR5 on the roadmap to no one's surprise, but we have a bit of a date on it. We'll keep this one short. Gamers Nexus has received an AMD internal roadmap from uh, someone with access to it with whom we've worked in the past and have verified. Internal roadmaps are constantly subject to change. They're not pushed to the public for a lot of reasons, but one of them is competitive, obviously, but the other one is that everything's subject to change. So these aren't public promises by AMD. It's something as a useful measure of when to look out for DDR5, but not necessarily something to bet on. And that's especially true given the current economic and manufacturing uncertainty in the world. So we wanted to set the stage with a disclaimer there because who knows if this stuff will change. We're not saying it's going to be fact. That said, we've got a pretty good idea. So uh, keeping in mind that you shouldn't overly sensationalize this news since it is just an internal roadmap, the roadmap we received indicates that 2022 is the year AMD is intending to put DDR5 on its CPUs. That will be with Zen 4 and its desktop platform. So that would be the premier or premium desktop platform as AMD calls it, and also some of the lower down products. The 2022 platform will unsurprisingly retain PCIe Gen 4. It doesn't look like it will be moving to 5 by then. And it should be a Zen 4 product. It's also intended to feature native USB 4 support. And then the APUs for that year are also supposed to have DDR5, but will be uh, apparently anyway Zen 3 Plus. But who knows? We'll see if that remains accurate. The mobile roadmap has DDR5 LP5 on board for 2022 and uh, that's also in the premium and in the gaming lines for notebooks. We have more information than that, but since we know how wildly internal roadmaps can change this far in the future of launch, uh, we're just going to exercise some responsibility here and withhold the rest until we're a bit closer to then. Next news item is a Ryzen 3 and 1300 AF story. The Ryzen 3 1300 X AF is already available, but mostly in Europe, so it's available on uh, some retailers in the UK and in Germany. The 1200 AF was just spotted by a computer base in Germany on their retailers as well. And this is following up the previous R5 1600 AF. AF is not the official naming, but the product SKU is AE Box for the original, just some letters thrown in there for tracking a SKU as always. And the updated version was AF Box. So the community took to calling it AF, and we were happy to stick with that trend when we reviewed the Ryzen 5 1600 AF. Somewhat comically, it seems like the retailers have caught wind of this too, because if you look on Amazon or Newegg now, they have, in many of the listings, officially renamed it to Ryzen 5 1600 AF, which isn't even actually the product name. So that's awesome. Uh, the community has affected change in the world in a very meaningful way. But Moving forward, the 3 1200 and the Ryzen 3 1300X, which many of you have likely forgotten because they didn't revive those lines for the 2000 series other than as APUs, they're supposed to likely be moving from the Global Foundry's 14 nanometer node to the 12 nanometer uh, 12 LP node that was used for the R5 1600 AF. The reason this was made for the 1600 at least, and probably the same for the Ryzen 3 chips, is because the Global Foundry's supply of silicon at 14 nanometers has dried up at this point, and AMD has probably completed its contracts there, so they have to source the wafer supply elsewhere, and they've decided to do that with the better of the architectures, the better of the processes, 
and also keep roughly the same name. And that's something we talked about in the previous review. In addition to an iterative node shrink, the AF part will also move the Ryzen 3 1200 likely to a Zen Plus architecture. We need to verify that once we get one. And that'll be an optimization over the vanilla Zen. The benefits of Zen Plus are primarily in IPC improvements. There are also tremendous memory support improvements. There are significant BIOS improvements in later motherboards that would be compatible with that part as well and improved uh, cache and memory latency, improved DDR4 memory controller. There are a lot of improvements here moving from 1000 series to 2000 series, but keeping the 1000 series name. Assuming the listing prices that we've seen pop up in Europe are correct, it looks like the one of the German retailers had it listed at 54, 73 euros, about 60 bucks. And if that listing's correct, then AMD is keeping the configuration the same as the original Ryzen 3 1200 non-AF meaning no change in clock speeds or reported uh, TDP or anything like that. But we'll see. We, we should have one on the way. Ryzen 5 1600 AF included the smaller Wraith Stealth Cooler, and we would assume the same to be true for the Ryzen 3 1200 AF, especially as the original Ryzen 3 1200 shipped with the Wraith Stealth Cooler anyway. And speaking of, we did really like the R5 1600 AF, if that isn't clear. It was an extremely, an insane value part at $85. And lately, it's been back to about that price after a brief spike. We'll link it in the description below in case you want to pick one up or watch our original review of it. Layoffs hit the Tor project in our next news story. As the current global situation continues to play out, many organizations and companies are tightening the belt. Small businesses and nonprofits have become particularly vulnerable, ones just like the Tor project. For those unfamiliar with the Tor project, it's responsible for pioneering onion routing through a decentralized network of servers and multiple layers of encryption. Tor's flagship products, alongside the Tor network, includes the Tor browser. Some time ago, we put together a guide on maintaining privacy, and that included the use of the Tor network and Tor browser to make up a significant chunk of that guide. The global issues have apparently impacted the Tor project severely, as Tor announced that it has had to lay off 13 staff members, and remember, 13 isn't an insignificant number when the resulting staff consists of 22 people. That's a large chunk of Tor's staff. Over the years, the Tor project has increasingly grown to rely on donations from the private sector to fund its work. With the global issues, we've changed the name of it this week, bringing nearly every aspect of the economy to a halt, it's hard to imagine there being enough private donations for Tor to meet its goals. Despite the layoffs, Tor vows to forge ahead and continue maintaining the Tor network and making its technology available for all. Unigen, the company famous for its Heaven benchmark and less famous for its Valley benchmark, has announced that it's rolling out a free version of the Unigen SDK. This is actually pretty interesting. The Unigen 2 community SDK is what's coming out. It's a free SDK or software development kit that features Unigen SDK at its core, along with support for C++, Unigen script APIs, and C Sharp, or as our friend in the industry Jim Vincent calls it, C Pound, because the professors will pound it into your head. As a real-time 3D engine, Unigen has been used for games, but hasn't gained the traction that, say, Unity has as an engine. Neither of them come anywhere close to Unreal Engine these days, in terms of popularity especially. Uh, Unigen is opening up its platform to the public, though, so We'll see if that could change. The Unigen engine is far more prolific in the arenas of visualization and simulation. Of course, Unigen is also the foundation for a slew of benchmarks that we all know. Again, Heaven, Valley, and most recently, Superposition. The Unigen 2 community SDK is free of charge and free of royalties, assuming one thing. Individuals or studios using the SDK commercially must not exceed revenue or project funding of $100,000 per year. Unigen Community will be developed in parallel with the commercial editions, Unigen 2 Engineering and Unigen 2 Sim, and adhere to the same quarterly update cadence. TSMC reported its earnings for the first quarter of 2020, which ended in March, the world's largest contract chip maker, which has exploded in usage and utilization the last couple of years, closed quarter one with a net profit of $3.89 billion and with a revenue, quarterly revenue, of $10.31 billion. That's a 90% increase year over year for TSMC, and it marks a 10-year quarterly profit growth. So TSMC, most of you likely know, but customers include NVIDIA, AMD, Apple, and mobile chip makers. So although the human malware situation has been disruptive to everybody, including TSMC, 
a 90% year-over-year growth is looking pretty good. That said, human malware's impact has been disruptive to TSMC's operations. It caused the foundry to be a little more conservative with its full-year outlook. TSMC expects revenue growth to reach a mid to high teens percentage for the whole year of 2020. This is compared to TSMC's previous revenue growth forecast of around 20%. If you're wondering what's causing this huge growth for TSMC, aside from everybody using it, uh, the main driver for TSMC, according to its financial statements, was anything 16 nanometers and below, which it classifies as an advanced process technology. These have been key drivers for the company's growth. That, coupled with the continued ramp for 5G and for HPC demand, has driven the company up. TSMC's advanced technologies accounted for 55% of its wafer revenue in quarter one, and notably, 7 nanometer made up a significant portion of that at 35% in terms of revenue by note. TSMC's N7 is its leading revenue maker for a given node right now. TSMC notes that its N7 node is in its third year of ramp, while its N7 Plus is in its second year. N7 Plus will be TSMC's first node to deploy EUV for four critical layers. N7 Plus will also lay the groundwork for TSMC's iterative N6 node, which is completely IP compatible with N7 and N7 Plus. N6 will increase the EUV layer count by one and is already in risk production. TSMC expects to enter volume production with N6 by the end of this year. Beyond N6, there's also N5, which is a full node evolution from N7 and which will extend the use of EUV or extreme ultraviolet lithography. And as a quick shout, we have a video on EUV on the channel where we spoke with David Cantor on uh, Intel 10 nanometer, but also EUV tech. N5 entered risk production last year, and TSMC has confirmed that N5 is already in volume production and healthy yields. N5 is expected to deliver a rough 1.8 times increase in density, as well as a 15% performance uplift, or speed at ISO power versus N7. Alternatively, N5 could deliver a 30% reduction in power at ISO speed compared to N7. TSMC also states it expects a, quote, very fast and smooth ramp of N5 in the second half of this year, driven by both mobile and HPC applications. That timeline coincides with persistent reports that Apple will be among TSMC's first customers to adopt its 5 nanometer chips in the form of the A14 Bionic SoC, powering Apple's 2020 phones. TSMC also finally had a bit more to say about its N3 note, saying that N3 is on track for risk production in 2021 and targeting volume production in 2022. TSMC has opted to remain on FinFET for N3 due to its maturity and costs, and N3 is expected to deliver around a 70% gain in density compared to N5. Following up to last week, AMD has indeed unveiled its Ryzen 3 3100 and 3100X CPUs, big surprise, along with the B550 chipset for socket AM4, finally. Been talking about this for long enough now. AMD has continually delayed B550. Motherboard manufacturers have, at this point, probably almost quarterly received new dates for B550, and it's been uh, perpetually pushed back, but it is coming out finally. These Ryzen 3 parts are not to be confused, just to make sure everyone understands now, with Zen 3 or with Ryzen 3000 alone. They are Ryzen 3000 parts, but when people say Ryzen 3, at least us here, unless we specify further, Ryzen 3 is supposed to just mean R3, as in the what started as the lower end quad cores for the Ryzen 1000 CPUs and then was discontinued in the Ryzen 2000 line, only brought back as APUs until just recently. Over the course of three generations with, with Zen, which is counted as Zen 1, Zen Plus and Zen 2, AMD has found itself firmly in the premium CPU vendor position now. Ryzen 3000 launched with the high-end SKUs. AMD did not offer a Zen 2 SKU with anything fewer than six cores and a price tag of $200 at launch. And thanks to AMD, Intel's product stack looks completely different these days. Comet Lake S, the i3 SKUs, are essentially becoming the i7 chips of yore. Intel has moved the i3 brand from dual core to quad core and is all but certain to extend hyperthreading to them as well. This would leave AMD vulnerable at the low end and we're assuming AMD realized this. Thus, we have the Ryzen 3 3100 and 3100X coming out. AMD promises that its Ryzen 3 parts, although not a surprise that a company would promise this about its product, but will be aggressive both in performance and in price. We will be independently verifying the claims and benchmarking it in our updated CPU testing suite 
which you'll see a video on soon. The positioning here, Andy has indisputably led the charge for competing on price over the last couple of years. And that strategy has worked off, especially with the multiple chiplet approach. In terms of performance, we need to see how it does in testing. We'll let you know. Intel has historically enjoyed an advantage in gaming performance, and that's been slowly whittled down to mostly the extreme high end, where at some level with the mid-range and lower end chips, it starts becoming questionable how the frame time consistency is maintained in certain games, where it might be an i3, i5 might be ahead on average, it can fall behind in significant ways in games that are taxing of thread count. So Ryzen 3, the 3100 and 3100X, it looks like AMD is setting the stage for another price war. The Ryzen 3 3100 is supposed to be priced at $100, and the 3100X should be $120. Both chips will be Zen 2 at their core and will leverage SMT, which is a first for R3 chips. Support is supposed to be for DDR4-3200, standard right now. It comes fully unlocked. It's got support for PCIe Gen 4. How much that matters? Well, for most people, almost not at all. But anyway, you cut it. Intel's looming i3 chips won't have it easy against Ryzen 3. Lastly, AMD is finally rolling out the budget-oriented B550 chipset for its motherboards, noting that it has over 60 designs in development with motherboard partners. AMD's B550 will bring PCIe Gen 4 to a broader user base and should be less price prohibitive than X570, which we have a lot of videos on it, but you don't really need an X570 motherboard in most instances. You go X470 or B450 and be perfectly fine. That said, the X570 boards have gotten really good and they're really starting to take that Intel approach of really pricing up the high end of them. The Ryzen 3 3100 and 3100X are expected to be available uh, May 21st of 2020, obviously, and the B550 board should arrive from AMD's partners June 16th of this year. Seagate and Western Digital acknowledge SMR concerns. In a quick update to last week's SMR story, both Western Digital and Seagate have responded publicly. Western Digital initially defended its position on SMR, mentioning that it doesn't always discuss, quote, what's under the hood, like drive-managed SMR or DMSMR and host-managed SMR, preferring to instead default to a specific use case discussion. It seemingly walked those comments back a bit with a decidedly more humble tone. Western Digital went on to disclose all of its client hard drives that use any form of SMR. These include drives in WD Red, Red Pro, Blue, Black, and Purple. WD went to on to state that it would update its marketing materials as well, add information about SMR, and include benchmarks and ideal use cases. That's an awfully big change from we don't really disclose it and it depends on the use case. It, it certainly sounds like a change that might be in fear of a class action lawsuit. Just not an expert here, but that's normally what happens in these instances. Seagate gave comments to Ars Technica about the matter as well, and this was regarding the use of SMR in some of its hard drives. Quote, Seagate confirms that we do not utilize shingled magnetic recording technology in any Ironwolf or Ironwolf Pro drives, purpose-built for NAS solutions. Seagate always recommends to use the right drive for the right application. Seagate was less forthright about its use of SMR in client desktop drives, though. Seagate seems to maintain that SMR is appropriate for consumer drives, and while Seagate's Exos and Archive hard drives are identified as using SMR, it still seems content to market its Barracuda drives with undocumented SMR use. Additionally, Gamers Nexus has reached out to Toshiba for clarification of its use or disclosure of SMR. We, at the time of filming, have not heard back. This is a few days later now. If we receive comment from Toshiba, we'll include it in next week's Hardware News episode. LGA 1200 should retain LGA 11.5X cooler compatibility, which is great news for anyone who likes to make use of large tower coolers, even like this one, for many years. So uh, last December, a drawing surfaced of LGA 1200 socket. This is what's supposed to be on Z490 motherboards. It's got 49 more pins than 1151. That's how the naming works. And the drawing indicated, although it was speculation at the time, that the compatibility with coolers would be the same. That's now been confirmed at this point. The uh, confirmation comes from Noctua, who posted the following quote on its product pages. It said, the heatsink mounting on Intel's new LGA 1200 platform, codename Comet Lake S, is identical to all LGA 11.5X sockets, 1150, 1151, 1155, and 1156. Therefore, all Noctua CPU coolers that support LGA 11.5X also support LGA 1200, 
and don't require mounting updates. Just from a cost control and economic standpoint, this is obviously always good news. This is why we also like seeing AM4 roll forward as far as is feasible. And in the very least, the mounting holes for AM4, we would like to see roll forward with AM5. Eventually, it'll change. But keeping the same mounting holes and retention system is key to reducing user cost on something that it's a big piece of metal. It doesn't really go bad. So rolling it forward makes a lot of sense. It's also good from an e-waste management perspective where you're talking about a potentially a two pound brick of copper and aluminum and to basically throw it away or recycle it just because it doesn't fit anymore seems kind of stupid when the whole point is to sink heat. So this is good and we like to see this. Cedar supercomputer hit with a hidden crypto mining process. Someone finally did it. We would love to know how much they made on it. But GN received a tip from a viewer who goes by Dr. Goose. Uh, presumably, Dr. Goose is friends with our other informant, Dr. Oh, sorry, Mr. Fahrenheit. He hasn't earned his PhD yet. He's, he'll presumably become Dr. Celsius later on. Uh, either way, uh, Dr. Goose, whom we think is a PhD in waterfowl and avian species, tipped us off about Cedar, a petaflop scale computer, supercomputer, that resides in Simon Fraser in University in Canada. Cedar was taken offline due to some security mishaps. An investigation was launched by Compute Canada, who deploy and maintain many of Canada's academic supercomputers after reports that Cedar was performing unusually slow. The team investigating, including members from both Compute Canada Federation and Simon Fraser University, found that there were hidden processes running between midnight and 6 a.m. Uh, Pacific time that were leading to significant system load. Upon discovery, Cedar was taken offline from Wednesday, April 15th, to midnight on Sunday, April 19th. While offline, Cedar was technically still running and queuing jobs. The investigation uncovered a cleverly hidden cryptocurrency mining process that was running from 12 to 6 a.m. daily. The process poached idle compute cycles, and it's believed by the team that the mining process was injected into Cedar through a compromised user account uh, and user key. The information that we received from Dr. Goose also indicated that the standard monitoring tools on Cedar were unable to detect the issue. It was obscured from them, and that's because it would automatically remove evidence of daily activities at 6 a.m. Pacific time. Therefore, the executable was not seen in the file system, and Compute Canada notes that there was no instance of personal or private data being compromised. So thanks to Dr. Goose for sending that in. If you would like to send in similar news tips to us, or uh, if you have any information for which you need to be protected, we do protect our sources, you can email that stuff to tips at gamersnexus.net. Finally, RTX Voice and some hardware sales information just quickly here. RTX Voice came out. It's interesting. We ran benchmarks on it. You can find it on the channel. Uh, from a usage standpoint, it seems to mostly work. There were instances where with a, a decent amount of fan noise, a reasonable amount for a high-end ma machine with maybe, let's say, uh, 360 rad and probably a, at a 20 inch distance about maybe 45 50 dBA of noise given that scenario it worked pretty well but in some instances we had problems where the voice would just cut out when it really shouldn't be and this is pretty common for any kind of noise reduction software so it still has some of the robotic tin to it as well when it's first kicking in and evaluating the voice but overall works decently for an early beta, and we have benchmarks on it if you're curious about the performance, and that's on the channel. Finally, hardware sales. There's a Ryzen 7 3800X, which we don't particularly recommend in most cases, but the price has dropped. So uh, the 3800X is 340 bucks on Newegg right now for a Mother's Day sale, and uh, I guess I take advantage of whatever you can. And the $340 price point is much more reasonable than its original launch price. The original $100 gap between the 37 and the 3800X was stupid, and it was obviously product segmentation just to try and get some more money. There might be some slightly better binning, but it's also largely irrelevant for most of the user base. And I think that'll cap us for this week. So thanks for watching. Subscribe for more. Go to store.gamersnexus.net or patreon.com slash gamersnexus. Helps out directly. And we'll see you all next time.